Oh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Glenn Matoma. I'm the director of Dodd Human Rights Impact, and it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you all to our virtual uh, space tonight uh, for the third annual awarding of the Malka Penn Prize for Human Rights in Children's Literature. Um, we're really excited about uh, tonight's event. It provides us a wonderful opportunity to extend recognition to a uh, tremendous uh, new work of children's literature in this space uh, by Kip Wilson, as well as to engage some of our Dodd Fellows from the Jewish Hartford European Roots uh, Program. Uh, there's many people to thank for, for tonight's event. I want to begin with the award committee uh, who has served and read uh, hundreds of books over the years. And uh, we're very grateful to them, to uh, Kate Capshaw, professor of English, uh, Ellen Cavanaugh, a PhD student in our curriculum and instruction department, Kristen Eshelman, the archivist for the Northeast Children's Literature Collection, uh, Doug Kaufman, Professor of Curriculum and Instruction and Literacy, uh, Susan Robb, President of Robb Associates, uh, Peggy Deitz Shea, uh, author and illustrator, and Joan Weir, also a doctoral student in curriculum and instruction. Uh, their hard work has, has, has made this possible. I also want to recognize and extend my, uh, my thanks to uh, Estelle Kaffer and Avi Pott from the Jewish Hartford and European Roots Project, who have been tremendous collaborators on this, as well as to Lisa Casau, whose uh, brilliant photography you'll see later as part of the educators' presentations. And of course, a special thank you to Nana Amos um, for her work as the program manager for Dodd Human Rights Impact, uh, her organizational uh, acumen and her, uh, I guess, new digital production uh, uh, skills in, in putting on events like this. Uh, you know, none of this would happen uh, without her. So, so thank you, uh, thank you all. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm particularly excited about this event. It's a little delayed. We had originally planned for the spring, uh, but this is the year of unexpected turns of events. Uh, and I think um, uh, one of the things we're learning, uh, and in part one of the things I, I, I learned from, uh, from Kip's book, is how to adapt to unexpected circumstances and to really rise to the challenge and see, see opportunities. So I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to have you all here today. Uh, so the Dodd Human Rights Impact programs seek to advance a broader culture of human rights at the University of Connecticut, in the state, and around the world. And we do this with a wide range of outreach and engagement programs, some of which focus on direct work with communities and organizations that are on the front lines of different kinds of human rights struggles. But we also recognize that the promotion of human rights doesn't just live in our laws and our institutions, but it lives in our hearts and our minds. And we believe that the arts has a fundamental, perhaps even a central role to play if we are to expand the universe in which people can uh, 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 know their rights, enjoy their rights, and stand up for the, the rights of others. This year is the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the Thomas J. Dodd Research Center. And the Dodd Human Rights Impact Programs uh, were founded, uh, actually not too long ago, precisely to extend the legacy both of Thomas J. Dodd and his son, Christopher J. Dodd, both of whom have served as United States Senators. I'm delighted to acknowledge that um, out there in Zoom land, and I'm, I'm sorry I can't, uh, I can't make eye contact to you, but, but Senator Dodd, I know you're, you're, you're watching tonight and we appreciate deeply your support and your engagement. It's precisely that support and that engagement that makes our programs possible. And it's the spirit of your service and your father's service uh, that animates our commitment to human rights. A key component, of course, of Thomas Dodd's service was his work as executive trial counsel at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg following the Second World War. And this year is the 75th anniversary of the beginning of what at the time was called the trial of the century. And an attempt to hold to account the perpetrators of the vast crimes of Nazi Germany. Significantly, that trial itself was also designed not only as a demonstration of the ability of law to address the greatest crimes, 
but also an object lesson. It was designed to be filmed and shown and seen and learned, not only in Germany, but around the world to put before uh, the, the, the global public recovering from the devastation of the Second World War, a vision for what justice might, might look like. 75 years later, we all know that that lesson still needs to be learned, including here in the United States today, where unfortunately, I think it's clear to many of us that the vicious animating ideology that was rampant in, uh, in Europe in the middle of the 20th century is not quite consigned wholly to the past, that it lives and breathes in the dark corners of our own country and around the world. I think the book we honor tonight is remarkable in part because it brings precisely those same lessons that were mobilized 75 years ago squarely into our moment, into our world today, and challenges us to reflect on what those who stood up at the time were able to do with their courage, with their sacrifice, and with their keen sense of right and wrong. And I think it's at this moment that we need those examples, that we need those stories, that we need those possibilities, that the moral imagination, that works of literature like what Kip has produced give us. And we need them particularly for our young people. For that, I'm extremely grateful uh, to our honoree uh, this evening, uh, Kip Wilson, uh, who you'll hear more from uh, in, in a moment. Um, uh, I also want to say, uh, you know, in addition to the, the presentation of the award and, and, and hearing from Kip, we're also going to hear from four remarkable educators about their own journeys to understanding this story and the lessons that they can, they can bring uh, uh, to others around them. Uh, we'll also have an opportunity uh, to have some Q&A at the end uh, with both Kip and the educators. Um, and I encourage you throughout the program, if you have questions, uh, to go ahead and put those in the chat. I'll be compiling those and we'll, we'll, we'll answer as many of those as are possible um, you know, at, the, at the end of the presentation. And then finally, um, we're very pleased to say that tonight at the end of the program, uh, each and every educator or, or really anybody who is on this call tonight, if you would like to receive your own copy of, um, of, of, of White Rose, uh, that, uh, that at the end I'll, I'll tell you how you, can, how you can receive one from us. Um, and then we'll, we'll also, there's a, we've got a, a kind of special announcement at the end as well uh, that you'll want to stay tuned for. Um, so Pretend that, that Michelle has just given me <laughs> this award, so I'll share that here. Um, it's just so beautiful and I'm so grateful um, to be honored with this wonderful award. Um, so um, as mentioned, I am Kip Wilson and I'm the author of White Rose. Um, it's the YA novel in verse written from Sophie Scholl's point of view, as you just heard. Um, before I get started, I also would like to give a huge thank you again to the whole Malka Pen Award Committee and also Glenn and Michelle and Nana and everybody involved for this beautiful award and for inviting me to share some of my work with you. Um, as a YA author, I write for American teenagers and I love this audience. Young people today are smart. They're passionate and determined about what they believe in, and they're thirsty for knowledge about the past so that they can use that knowledge to lead us forward into a better future. Finally, they can also be reckless and impulsive, which makes them very good at doing brave things in spite of dire consequences, which is exactly why role models like Sophie and Hunt Scholl are so appealing. And yet, most American teenagers have never heard of the White Rose or Sophie Scholl. And I was no exception when I was a teenager. I learned about them in my high school German class, which is still one of the only ways to learn about them in school in the US. And this is one of the reasons I wrote my book, 
in the hopes that teenagers who don't study German could learn about them too. So just another quick overview from my side about the group. The White Rose was a resistance group during World War II at the University of Munich. It was started and led by a group of German students. The group consisted of Sophie Scholl, her older brother Hans, as well as several friends, most of them uh, medical students like Hans. These young people were disgusted with their fascist government and they decided that their country's youth had to do something about it because the adults were too afraid. The work of the White Rose focused on passive resistance, mainly on writing and distributing anti-Nazi leaflets. But this was extremely dangerous at the time. Today, for the most part, we are lucky that we can protest peacefully, express our opinions, and find ways to resist. Under the Nazi dictatorship, speaking out was treason, punishable by death. Sophie and the others who were part of the White Rose undertook their important work, knowing full well the consequences. Their courage makes them the perfect example to inspire teens today to express their opinions and to make a difference. So I'm going to share a presentation with you that um, it's an abridged an adapted slightly version of the presentation I share with students in schools and libraries. The purpose of my visits isn't just to talk about my book, but to make this history relevant for students by sharing with them similar role models out there today and by encouraging them to use their own voices and to take a stand in their own lives as well. So in just a second here, let's see, I just need to share my screen, I believe, and I should be able to share the presentation. Um, this is it, share. All right, and I just have to now start it. If I can get under there, <laughs> here we go, slideshow. Um, beginning, okay, there we go. Um, every word that comes out of Hitler's mouth is a lie. This is a line from one of the White Rose leaflets. So Hans and Sophie um, are determined to get these leaflets in the hands of their fellow students. Uh, so what they do is, you know, they undertake something very risky. They were already being risky, writing leaflets, getting them out, sent around their cities and sent to other cities. But they decide to take a whole suitcase and briefcase filled with these leaflets to their university in broad daylight. So this is a very risky. Uh, I'm just going to start off by reading you a couple of poems right from this section in the book, because to me, this, this is the moment that captured my heart. The suitcase. After another late night meeting with Hans, Alex, Billy, I sleep in, skipping my morning lecture and letting the diluted February sun kiss me awake through the window. I hear Hans rummaging in his desk across the flat and I rub my eyes, wondering if last night's talk was just talk or if he's ready to carry this out. I'm up. I splash some water on my face, get dressed, run a comb through my hair, make some toast, the most normal things in the world. And when Hans emerges, cheeks pale, pupils wide, I ask him about the suitcase under the bed. Doing something. A smile filled with recklessness spreads across my brother's face and I can't help grinning back. Though, if I'm honest with myself, my insides are equal parts dread and excitement. I nod fingers trembling with a rush of anticipation when I realize he and I are really going to do this. These here are the last known photos um, taken at Gestapo headquarters of Sophie and Hans. Um, but when I talk to kids, <laughs> Even though this is this is the last slide I share from the presentation, 
I don't leave them with this impression because I have to say, Sophie, Sophie and Hans got to see their parents in before they were executed. And they were both so determined and so steadfast in their beliefs that they had done the right thing and that there would be this revolution. And they didn't care that they were giving up their lives. They were doing this for a wonderful cause and they were glad and their parents were proud of them. Um, and I like to, to tell kids about something that Fritz, Sophie's boyfriend, even though they didn't always see eye, eye to eye, um, he said to her once, Sophie, you must follow your heart, your mind, your conscience, or you will not be Sophie any longer. And that's exactly what she did. And that's exactly what I ask the students to do now going forward to, to stand up for others and to try to make a difference in other people's lives um, because young people have the power to do so. And I want to see them all empowered um, in the best way possible. Um, so thank you for allowing me to speak here. I'm gonna do my stop the share and hand it back. Um, okay. Wonderful, thank you so much. And, and I think that's a, a good opportunity then to, to pivot to uh, our educators who, who, who we wanted to foreground as well. Uh, you know, your book, it, it, it just so happens your book is on a topic that fits with, you know, we, we, we broadly think of human rights and there's lots of, but, but your book in particular um, uh, uh, made it clear that we needed to partner with uh, those we've been working on in our genocide and Holocaust education work. It's a part of Dodd Human Rights Impact statewide and national efforts. Um, to promote a uh, better understanding of uh, genocide and Holocaust uh, history, but also really to foreground the notion that all of this is at the end of the day, fundamentally anti-genocidal, right? I mean, I guess that should be obvious, but putting that out in front makes certain things clear about the stories we tell and about the lessons we learn. And, and, and our Jewish Hartford European Roots project was in part conceived around this notion that part of our efforts in genocide and Holocaust uh, education cannot just be focused on the machinery of death. It also has to be on the way of life. And in particular, the way of life of the targeted groups. Genocide is at the end of the day an attempt to murder a group, to erase them from history, uh, to erase their culture, their very being. And so anti-genocidal education must make sure that that continues. And the Jewish Hartford European Roots project is, is expressly designed to do that. The four educators that you'll, you'll hear from in a moment all participated in, uh, in a summer trip organized by Jewish Hartford European Roots Program uh, last summer when, when we could go places um, uh, to, to Eastern Europe. Uh, we sponsored them as educator fellows with the idea that this immersive experiential learning that they would engage in needed to come back to us to be shared out with others. And what you'll see tonight is a sample of what they're bringing back. And I hope you'll, you'll, you'll continue to engage us uh, going forward. Uh, the, the, the team of, of, of four that you'll hear from tonight have put together a human rights teaching framework for their experience known as Roots, Resistance, Rescue, and Renewal. Uh, the Roots portion focuses on introducing students to pre-war Jewish life and to ensure that the great civilization, the great culture uh, that was uh, targeted by the Nazi regime uh, is not forgotten and, and, and lives on in, in, in many ways. It also chronicles the deep roots of anti-Semitism that connect to, uh, to the perpetration of the Holocaust. The second theme is resistance and it, uh, like Kip's book, examines the various forms of resistance that took place among the Jewish people in the ghettos, in the camps and elsewhere, uh, sometimes with allies, uh, sometimes on their own. Uh, the third theme of rescue examines the various ways in which allies in particular aided the rescue of uh, individuals and groups throughout the entire period. And then finally, the renewal frame looks at the 
post-Holocaust continuation of Jewish life and Jewish culture and examines the preservation of Jewish sites, of museums, of history and memory, both in Europe and, and beyond. Uh, the four educators who will be presenting uh, in, in, a, in a moment, I'm going to introduce them all briefly here uh, so that we can, uh, we can dive right into to what they're going to share with you. First Roots will be presented by Alan Berkowitz, who for over 25 years has been involved with promoting Holocaust, genocide, and human rights education. Uh, his book, Spain and the Jews During the Holocaust, was recently published uh, just last year in Spain. Uh, he is a founding member of OneByOne.org, which is an organization that was created by participants in a dialogue group of descendants of the Third Reich and their victims. And he is also a founding member of Voices of Hope and serves on numerous Holocaust and Gen genocide education committees. Next up will be Rachel Torres uh, on resistance. Uh, Rachel is a New Yorican. Uh, from the Bronx, who transplanted to Newtown, Connecticut, say 15 years ago. She teaches ninth grade uh, world history and 12th grade AP psychology at Newtown High and advises the geography team and students advocating for diversity and empowerment, or SAID. Uh, she is a Yukon Dodd Human Rights Impact Fellow, as is uh, Alan, Kim, and Krista, uh, and has traveled and, and through that program traveled to Lithuania and, and, and Poland. Uh, her greatest accomplishment is her 22-year marriage and four children. After Rachel, uh, Kimberly Bolaro will present on rescue. Kimberly is the director of the Hero Center, which is a joint initiative between Voices of Hope and the Morris Greenberg Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Hartford. She holds degrees in history and Irish studies uh, and is a Kelta certified English trainer. She taught English and serves as director uh, of studies in the language school in Germany for over seven years uh, before returning to the United States. And then finally, repair and renewal will be, will be presented by Krista Penrose. Uh, Krista is a proud graduate of the NEAG School of Education at UConn and is currently serving as a social studies teacher at Rom High School in Hebron, Connecticut. She specializes there in Western European history, economics, and inquiry-based instruction. With that, I will turn it over to Alan. Thank you, Dr. Matoma. You know, it's a, it's a great honor to be a Dodd Human Rights Impact Fellow, and a pleasure to be with all of you this evening to recognize Dr. Wilson for her exemplary work. One of the major objectives and goals for this fellowship was to travel to Eastern Europe to explore the great diversity vitality and challenges of Eastern European Jewish life and integrate this knowledge into our work with educators and students. The stereotype of European Jewish life as a continuous series of persecutions and victimizations are debunked by the long stretches of Jewish communal prosperity and cultural advancement. We experienced how Eastern European Jewish life had become the global center for Jewish innovation and adaptation to an ever-changing world. We had the good fortune to be guided on this trip by Professor Samuel Kassoff. We visited centers that were designed for no other purpose than human destruction. They assault our morality. They provoke our outrage and disgust. They leave us with the need to know how humans could act in such ways and how to prevent these horrors from manifesting itself time and time again. Make no mistake, this is important and difficult history to navigate. At times it necessitates the compartmentalization of our emotions so that we may reach beyond the events themselves and attempt to answer a host of underlying questions. So how do we teach these difficult lessons? First and foremost, we must become connected to the humanity of the targets of oppression and grant them the same dignity, respect, and cultural appreciation we reserve for ourselves. This is why it's essential to give students a glimpse into the richness of Jewish civilization before the onset of exterminatory victimization. It allows us the opportunity to connect with people as fellow human beings. At the poll. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, everyone, and congratulations to Kip Wilson for your honor, as well as a thank you to you for writing such an empowering book that honors 
those who risked their lives so that others could live. Uh, as was mentioned before, my theme was resistance. And resistance, in a sense, is a response to oppression and persecution. While in Lithuania, we visited the Ponari Forest. It is the biggest site of the mass killings organized and perpetrated by the Nazi regime to, in Lithuania. The Vilnius Special Squad were Lithuanians who executed more than 100,000 people, 70,000 who were Jewish from July 1941 until 1944. In an attempt to erase all the evidence of their crimes, the Nazis forced 80, 000, 80 prisoners to unearth the corpses and burn them. They were told to check the mouths for gold teeth and bodies for jewelry before incinerating them. On April 15, 1944, 22 brave souls resisted by escaping through a tunnel which they had dug in the course of two and a half months. Only 11 survived. Two days later, Lithuania was liberated. I always like to tell my students that resistance doesn't always come in the form of protests with fists in the air and marching in the streets. Sometimes it comes in the form of doing whatever is necessary for survival. If you could go back one slide, please. Thank you. Uh, my students always ask, why didn't the Jews fight back? Well, they did. There was armed resistance in the ghettos, but always at a great cost. Partisans were outnumbered by Nazis and had to be aware of traitors in the community. The Nazis would seek revenge by killing those left in the ghetto. Partisans engaged in acts of sabotage, including taking supplies from German peasants and attacking Nazi resources and lines of communication. This was a young woman whose name we do not know but this image clearly demonstrates her involvement in the resistance that took place in Panari. Unfortunately, she was killed, but she died offering resistance for its own sake. Next, please. While in Europe, I learned the multifaceted ways in which Jews resisted Nazi oppression and persecution, be it political, armed, spiritual, economic, and cultural resistance. They were not sheep led to the slaughter. Jews fought back. This milk can that you see before you is a perfect example of the creative ways in which the Jews chose to resist. In Poland, we visited the Jewish Historical Institute where the Oneg Shabez archives are located. It was a secret code named for the group in the Warsaw Ghetto that purposed itself to document the plight of the Jews under German occupation. Under the leadership of Emanuel Ringelblum, from 1940 to 1943, members interviewed people, they compiled testimonies, photographs, artwork, examples of German propaganda memoirs, anything that revealed daily life in the Warsaw Ghetto. They engaged in a very clever, sophisticated, and brave form of resistance. It was a super clandestine operation. And then on August 3rd of 1942, the archives were buried, and only three of the members knew where they were located. Participants suspected that they would not live to see liberation, but were motivated by the mission to write their own history. I also see this as a form of spiritual resistance, as it was an attempt to maintain one's previous way of life and his or her own unique identity. Next slide, please. The milk can also contain drawings, like this one by a mother of her daughter. Excuse me and a photograph of the two of them before they perished. These were placed inside the milk can so that their memory would live on. Next. Speaking about these topics with all of these educators is, is always such a moving thing. And so, um, Rachel, I'm, I'm 
happy. I'm always so happy to to see you present in in such a a meaningful way. Um, so I'm I'm so happy to be here with all of you tonight. Um, first, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Matoma, Nana Amos, Michelle Palmer, Estelle Kafer, Lisa Casso, and my fellow educators for their kindness and support through our time together uh, and in preparation for tonight's presentation. Um, I'd also like to extend my congratulations again to Kip on an exceptional work um, that is well deserving of this recognition. My experience as an educator fellow with uh, the, the Dodd Human Rights Impact can only be described as inspirational. The chance to see the places I had read about for years led by an exceptional scholar, Sam Cassow, was truly the chance of a lifetime. It was a very difficult trip, uh, yet one I would do over and over again. And if I had the chance, I would do it with the very same people who you've, you've met tonight. Our travels provided us with so many answers, which led us to so many more questions. Um, and we are now left with the task of conveying this knowledge to our students. The richness of pre-war Jewish life and culture, the darkness of the destruction, the rays of hope that shined through that darkness and the vibrant renewal that come that continues today. My focus as an educator fellow has been on rescue. I gravitated toward this because it is in examples of rescue that one finds these rays of hope. Rescue during the Holocaust was very much uh, an act of resistance, as Kip mentioned. It was difficult, it was dangerous, it was complex, and it was illegal. Yet throughout our trip, we learned of acts, both big and small, that saved lives. From well-known stories, such as Oscar Schindler's factory in Krakow, and Chun Sugihara, the Japanese diplomat, diplomat who you see in the slide here, um, who wrote thousands of travel visas to help vulnerable, vulnerable people escape Kovno, Lithuania, um, to stories of individual acts that helped people escape roundups, selections, um, or to escape being led into the forests where their, their neighbors and family members never returned, never returned from, I should say. So these acts of kindness and humanity show us that we are all capable of making a difference. And I think throughout Kip's work, we see a young girl with a deepening urge to do something, to help someone, to stand up against injustices and to make a difference. This urge to help and inspire is one of the very reasons why every one of us entered the field of education, I'd say. In the examples Kip gave us tonight, I found myself again overwhelmed by the power of young people and the number of difficult issues they face today. I think all of us as educators have experienced working with students who have faced trauma, tragedy, and any number of, of other issues. So how do we even begin to ask them to have hope? How do we encourage them to use their voice to convince them that their voices are important and can influence change? Sophie Scholl and the White Rose Society are now seen as heroes, martyrs. But what is exceptional about Kip's work is that it reminds us that Sophie was essentially a young kid who struggled immensely with what was going on around her. Um, she struggled to find her voice in her disillusionment of Nazi society, as, as Kip mentioned before. Kip? Hello, everyone. So my name is Krista Penrose, and I am a sophomore social studies teacher here at Ram High School out in Hebron, Connecticut. Um, I focus mostly on Western European history and have been teaching this for about the last 10 years. And last year, when I saw an advertisement for this trip, I remember thinking that I know so very little about the Jewish experience in Europe. Um, I don't know about other teachers out there, but for my town, the Jewish experience is relatively minimal or oftentimes overlooked. Uh, the textbooks our school has issued for our students contains only about two pages about the Jewish narrative. 
um, and of course those fall at the Holocaust. So when I first saw this trip pop up, I thought this was going to be perfect. It's a way for me to learn about that Jewish experience outside of just the Holocaust, put that Holocaust in context the way Alan talked about, and hopefully make this more meaningful. Because for my students and for so many others, they learn about the Holocaust for so long, which can be such an amazing blessing, but also can be almost overwhelming and daunting for them. So I went on this trip and was so honored to work with all these amazing people. Um, and to have an amazing roommate, of course. But what I learned went so far above and beyond just the content. I mean, Dr. Casso and all the amazing presenters told me more information than my head will ever be able to wrap around. But more than that, I realized the humanity and the empathy that's so essential when teaching the Holocaust. Um, most notably, when we were at Treblinka, um, I remember looking around in this massive field of stones um, and thinking how overwhelming it was that I had assumed that every stone represented a life that had been lost. And I'll never forget the moment when our tour guide mentioned that every stone was not one person, but the uncountable stones around us were in fact a, a, each representing a village that was destroyed um, and lost. It teaches you how much more important the subject is. Again, I teach Western European history. I mean, most public school teachers know we have 180 days to cover more content than we can ever imagine. Um, but my pledge or request for you today is to try to take a few more days on the Holocaust. And instead of just focusing on the unimaginable destruction, to take a day or so to focus at least on renewal, which is my section of the curriculum we've been developing. Um, if I could leave you with one final thought um, or one idea from my presentation, it would be never to end the historical narrative of any tragedy amidst that terror. There's so much life that comes after the Holocaust. I mean, yes, there are struggles and liberation is no easy feat, but people rebuild and there's life and there's hope and there's joy. And by removing that from the curriculum, we are in fact taking away one of the most powerful messages of the Holocaust. Um, that, that hope can be restored and that together we can build a more amazing world. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Krista. And of course, thanks to Alan and Rachel and Kim. Uh, those were all really uh, powerful and I think uh, frames beautifully what we hoped the trip would mean, what we hope the Jewish Hartford European Roots project would embody and actually what we hope the uh, the overall emphasis on uh, on a human rights based approach to genocide and Holocaust education can do.